Hello Gardener, today I'm doing something a little bit different. I'm reviewing the successes and failures of my 2023 garden. I'm going to share my knowledge on why certain things were successful so that you can replicate it at home. And I'm going to share with you my failures because chances are you struggled with it as well. But most importantly, the root cause of those failures so we can all avoid it next year. If you're new here, hello and welcome. My name is Jara and I teach people how to garden and grow food. This video is one of many gardening videos that can be found on my channel where I share my knowledge about growing food and other edible plants. If you want to grow a green thumb, make sure you subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any of my videos. I'm curious, what garden successes or failures did you have this year? Please comment below and share. Maybe you finally got your technique down and was able to grow a particular vegetable for the first time. Maybe you planted something new and it grew amazingly well. Or you're struggling with something and would like some help. I guarantee you that someone else is struggling with the same thing. So let's share our successes and or failures to help each other out in the comments below. Right now, as I film this video, it's the very end of December. There's not much going around in the garden. So it's a perfect time to just kind of review what happened this last season and year. Every year I have a garden journal and I just take a lot of notes, basically my observations about the garden. Things like if I noticed a certain pest population really surged during a particular time of the year or my harvest of a particular crop was really great because I direct sow seeds during a certain month. Noting observations like that will really help you learn your garden quickly. In December, I get the new journal for the new year and I just kind of review all the pages of the old journal and transfer the most important information that I feel I need to keep track of into the new journal. So it really helps me review what happened last year. All right, so let's talk about my garden. Let's start with the bad so we can end this video on a positive note. If you're feeling frustrated as a gardener, I just want you to know that things go wrong every year, no matter your gardening level or experience. Failure is part of gardening. My garden is not perfect. I still kill a lot of plants. I lose crops every year. As time goes by, I learned to hone in on my gardening skills, which definitely helps me be more successful than not. The important thing is that you don't give up and you learn from your mistakes and struggles. You will learn more from your failures as a gardener than the successes because it forces you to analyze the situation and research solutions. I'm going to share a few of my failures and struggles from this year's garden and what I'm going to do about it next year to avoid it from happening or at least as much as possible. The biggest issue this year was the record-breaking heat this summer. I think we all felt it no matter where you're located. Heat does a couple things to plants and the garden. First off, it causes pests and diseases to go crazy. So if you feel that you struggled extra hard this year with pests and diseases, well, that's why. On top of that, a lot of plants have issues pollinating or holding onto flowers, which become fruit and veggies later when temperatures get extreme, like over 90 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Pollen actually gets denatured or damaged, or plants like tomatoes, for example, are so stressed out that they start dropping their flowers so they're unable to produce fruit. So how do we remedy these issues caused by higher than normal temperatures? Number one, start planting more heat tolerant or tropical types of crops during the summer. I would not be surprised if we continue to see higher than normal temperatures every year. Plant things that can tolerate it. I look to other subtropical and tropical regions of the world like Asia, South South America, Africa, and the Caribbean as inspiration for what to grow during the summer. Florida summer is jungle gardening. Think what grows well in a jungle. A lot of these food crops are not well known in standard American culture and cuisine, but they grow fantastic in the heat. My family is from the Dominican Republic, so I grew up eating a lot of these crops, not so well known in the standard American diet. And my best friend is from Hong Kong, so she has taught me so much about Asian cuisine and vegetables. I will try my best to share my knowledge about those crops with you guys, but I encourage you to check out your local Asian or Latin American grocery stores, eat at restaurants to taste new things and get inspired to try growing some of them. If you're going to ask me what I recommend to grow in the middle of a hot summer, here's a few ideas for you. And I probably have seeds or plants on my website if you want to try growing them. It's important to add perennial edibles to your garden just in case your annual crops don't do too well. So think about the fruit trees or plants that grow in your area or are native and produce during the summer. For me, that is things like Barbados cherry, pineapples, mangoes, mulberries, blackberries, and muscadine grapes. Think about tropical high yielding calorie dense root crops like sweet potatoes, yucca, yams, and taro. The number two thing to combat this heat is to use shade cloth. There is not so much you can do about temperatures, hot or cold, unless you're gardening in a controlled environment like a greenhouse with AC or growing things indoors. But we all can't do that. I can't. The only other thing you can do is set up shade cloth. And honestly, guys, I have never used shade cloth. I really don't want to invest time in figuring that out, buying supplies and setting it all up. But a lot of you have told me over the years how much of a difference it makes since it keeps your plants a few degrees cooler. It can extend your harvest a little bit longer into the summer months or help plants at least survive the heat of summer so they start producing again once temperatures drop and fall. Since last summer was so hot, I plan on installing 
some shade cloth over the most heat sensitive plants like my tomatoes and various greens to test how it goes. If you have any tips for me about using shade cloth, please comment below. I would really appreciate it a lot. I learned just as much from you guys as you do from me. This heat brings me to the next failure in my garden this year. I am now starting to see signs of nematodes in my garden, which I never noticed before in all the seven years I have been gardening here. And that really sucks because they are a very tough pest to get rid of. Nematodes are a microscopic worm that infect the roots of lots of plants, essentially cutting the plant off from nutrients, and then it slowly dies. Once a plant has it, that's pretty much it. There is no cure. Best thing to do is to remove the plant to stop further spread of nematodes in your garden. Nematodes eat roots for fruit trees, veggies, and even weeds and grass. They eat everything. They thrive in warm and wet soils, so my extra hot garden this summer was the perfect breeding ground for them. Northern states don't have a nematode issue because it gets cold enough during the winter to kill them in the ground. But here in the south, areas with no snow or where the ground doesn't freeze, nematodes survive. So far, I have only noticed them on some of my squash or pumpkin plants, not my tomatoes or peppers yet, which I think is kind of weird. If you notice them in one spot of your garden, you might as well assume they're everywhere. So what am I doing about this? I'm paying more attention to crop rotation so they don't build up in certain spots in my garden. For example, I won't plant squash or pumpkins in the same spot for three years in a row. I'm solarizing portions of my garden during the summer to kill them. I am dedicating more time to weeding because they eat grass and weed roots, basically removing their food source. I'm also adding crab meal into the planting hole for everything. Crab meal is made of chitin, which is a food source for beneficial nematodes that eat the bad kind of nematodes. I am planting dwarf marigolds all over the base of nematode susceptible plants, kind of like using them as a cover crop. There's just not one solution to combating nematodes. It requires all of these things to treat it effectively. The next thing that I struggled with was pest pressure, more than the usual I get every year. I'm curious if you felt the same way. I blame it on the hot weather. Stink bugs and squash bug populations were out of control this year. They are hard to treat for because they have a hard shell, so in general, spray type of treatments don't work on them. Unless you want to be using some kind of broad spectrum, non-organic chemical spray, which I don't use in my garden, the only thing you can do is pick the adults off your plants by hand. Then you can drop them in a bucket of soapy water to drown them, stomp on them, or what I like to do is vacuum them up with a hand vacuum. I don't know about you, but I don't want to touch them. Plus, my son thinks vacuuming bugs is fun, so I get him to help me out with it. The other thing that helps is planting trap crops. I notice stink bugs and squash bugs are attracted to sunflowers and blue hubbard squash. Planting these things at the back of your garden to lure them over there and away from your precious crops. Some people ask me, wouldn't I be attracting more of them into my garden by planting these trap crops? In my opinion, they are coming regardless, so you might as well control where they go by planting trap crops. I have a trap crop garden seed collection on my website with six plants that work well as trap crops if you need some help deciding what to plant. These bugs are attracted and start congregating on the trap crops, which make it easier to go through one spot of my garden and catch a lot of them at the same time. You need to remove the adults from your garden because they will lay hundreds of eggs. That's how you break their life cycle. If you ignore them, like I did for a while, they quickly populate and attack everything in your garden. I was dealing with stink bugs all spring and summer long. Just insane. This time I know they start appearing in spring, usually in March, so I will be on the lookout and be more diligent removing them before their populations spike. Spider mites and mealybugs were also out of control this year. Again, I didn't nip it in the butt early on, so their populations just went crazy by the time I started treating for it. Spider mites are tiny microscopic spiders, and mealybugs look like a white fluffy substance on the stems of your plants. Both of these pests quickly reproduce and then spread to other plants. In large numbers, they literally suck the life out of your plants. I got them so bad they destroyed my Everglades tomato patch. And if you have ever grown Everglades tomatoes, you know they are very hard to kill. Spider mites and mealybugs are sucking types of insects, so use treatments that target soft-bodied, sucking insects. I like to spray with safer brand organic insecticidal soap. I'll put links in the description below to any products or supplies I mentioned in this video. If I don't see an improvement in a few days, then I switch to Spinosad because that kills soft-bodied insects on contact. I like to start with the more mild organic treatment options before trying something more strong. And really, no matter the pest, what it comes down to is early detection and treatment. Check your plants every day and have treatments in stock at home so you can treat for it as soon as you notice them. Pest populations increase every day that goes by, 
which will require more treatment and work to get rid of them if you don't take care of it as soon as you notice it. The last bad thing that I struggled with this year was my melon or cantaloupe crops. I didn't get around to planting them in the spring, so I direct sowed seeds in early September thinking that I could get a harvest in before the cold weather arrived and during winter. They were not happy. Once temperatures started cooling down in October and November, they started dying back. They were way more sensitive to cold than I thought. Also in Florida, we could still get some intense rain during the fall time, either via hurricanes or just days in a row of rain. That happened a few times and my melons just caught all sorts of diseases. I was not able to harvest any of them during the fall. Going forward, I have dedicated melon growing to springtime only. The temperatures are warm and it's actually dry season here in Florida, so that will help lessen the incidence of leaf diseases. Actually, last spring, I grew a bunch of Kajari melons, which are native to India, so very heat tolerant, and I had a huge crop. Probably my favorite of all the melon type things that I've ever grown. I do have seeds on my website if you wanna try growing some. I think that was proof that springtime climate is best for melon growing in the South. I mean, farms do grow tons of watermelons during the summer, even here in Florida, but those are farms that have machinery, expertise, and chemicals that a regular home backyard gardener like myself does not have. All right, so that summed up the biggest failures and learning experiences in my garden from this year. Let's talk about what worked out great. I got to start with my favorite. I finally got around to installing a decent drip irrigation system with a little fertilizer mixer that pushes fertilizer through the drip irrigation lines. And oh my God, what a game changer. I think in all my years gardening, this was the biggest and best thing I did besides adding massive amounts of wood chips every year, which has composted down and provided me with super rich soil to plant things in. Drip irrigation has saved me so much time that I can now dedicate time to other things like keeping my garden weed free or keeping up with the pests. And my plants are just happy they're getting consistent water and nutrients. I hooked up this system to an automatic water timer that I control with an app on my phone. So now I can go on vacation and not worry about how many plants are going to be dead when I come back home. So yeah, best thing ever. I did make a tutorial showing you how I installed my drip irrigation system into my garden, which I will link below if you want to learn more about that. Another successful thing in my garden this year is my brassicas, like my broccoli and cauliflower. I was on point this year with starting them from seed and getting them transplanted into the garden. In the south, we have a very small window to grow things in the brassicas family. They need several months in a row of cool temperatures to develop a head or crown of broccoli, for example. Otherwise, they just bolt, which means they stop forming that crown and go straight to flowering. Not very good for eating. As you can see, my plants look really good, and I'm starting to get my first head of broccoli. Last year, I was late planting them and got nothing, not a single piece of broccoli or cauliflower, except for Piracicaba Brazilian sprouting broccoli, which is the most heat tolerant broccoli thing I have ever grown. I talk about this one all the time. I'm even in the process of shooting a dedicated YouTube video all about growing Piracicaba. That's how much I love it. I do have seeds on my website if you want to try growing it. Besides the brassicas this year, my fall tomatoes was the best season I ever had. I planted them during Labor Day weekend, so I got them in the ground early and I started harvesting in October and November. I'm still harvesting tomatoes right now in December. I was lucky that this year I didn't get hit directly by any hurricanes because last year I got hit by two of them in a row which killed off my entire tomato crop. So I'm very happy that didn't happen this year. Both my brassicas and tomato crops are proof that planting on time is really worth it. Another success has to do with solarization. I decided to solarize a section of my garden in an attempt to reduce tomato wilt, which killed a lot of my tomato plants last year, and spread of nematodes. If your tomatoes look great one day and then all of a sudden the next day they're wilted for no good reason, they probably got infected by one of the various bacteria or viruses that cause tomato wilt. It cannot be cured and your plants are not going to bounce back. It's best to just yank out the whole plant, throw it in the trash because now it's a host for the pathogen that causes wilt and pour some hot boiling water into the planting hole. I solarized my garden from July through August, right in the middle of my summer. I wanted it to get hit hard by the most amount of heat and sun possible. And what a difference. I have not lost one single tomato plant to wilt this fall. To solarize, I used a six millimeter thick plastic sheeting. I find that the white frosted plastic works better than the the clear stuff. In my experience, I don't know why, but everyone says to use the clear ones, but I find that too much light gets through with the clear ones and the weeds still grow underneath. The white frosted stuff killed everything below it. You can also use other colors of plastic sheets, weed blocking material, or tarps. You just need something that's going to block out all of the sunlight. Not only did it disinfect my soil, basically, but it also killed out all the weeds, making the area perfect for planting in fall. I plan to shut down parts of my garden and solarize each year during the summer going 
going forward. Lastly, something that surprised me, if you don't know, I'm also a beekeeper and I raise backyard chickens. These hobbies complement gardening so much. Sometimes I post YouTube video tutorials about these topics because most likely if you're a gardener, you're interested in bees and chickens too. Let me just say that the biggest help in my garden is not from another human, it's from my chickens. They can do so much work for you, let me explain. Last winter, my chickens stopped laying eggs, just like what happened with many chicken farmers across the United States, and that caused egg prices to skyrocket. Chickens are triggered to lay eggs by the amount of sunlight that is available. Well, their coop is in a shady spot, so they stop laying eggs in the winter when there are even less daylight hours available anyways. So that prompted me to build a mobile coop to move them around sections of my second garden in St. Cloud, Florida on my aunt's property. Not this garden here. I live in an HOA community and I can't have chickens or bees here. I was able to move my chickens into full sun and rotate them around, which caused them to start laying eggs again. Then I noticed how good they are at cleaning and tilling land. They ate everything to the ground. We're talking patches of thick grass and weeds. They ate the the plants, their seeds, and any pest or insects, all the while kicking up the soil, making it nice and fluffy, or basically tilling it for me, and fertilizing it with their poop. Literally in just a few weeks, I had sections of land completely cleared out and ready for planting without me having to do any of that hard work. I know not everyone can have chickens, but if you have been thinking about it, I really hope you get some this year. They are the best pet I ever had and best garden helper. I am in the middle of shooting a whole backyard chicken series for the spring to help you get started and especially share my tricks to automating it all and making it super easy to have chickens. So more to come. But yeah, really enjoying that mobile coop and using my chickens as little garden workers. So this sums up my garden successes and failures for the year 2023. I hope this gave you guys some ideas on what to do or not do this year. If you have any tips, advice, or want to share your own garden experiences this year, please drop a comment below. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and join me in the next episode as we continue to grow together. Happy gardening!